Right, so we are continuing our uh, theory about the, the, the core beliefs of the church. What does it look like to follow Jesus? Uh, so just so you know, on the back of your handouts today, I did put where we're heading, <laughs> where we've been and where we're heading. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's there for you today. But Titus 1.9, essentially, why are we doing this? Well, Titus 1.9 says that the job of elders and leaders in the church is to teach sound doctrine. And so one of the best things we can do as a church family is to go through what do we believe and why do we believe it? And, and why does that matter? So in this series, we've been looking through some of these things. Last week, we ended our message. Last week was the uh, creation of humanity. It was, it, was, it was kind of talking about, and we talked about how God at the very end of it, how we ended our service last week, really, in, as far as in Scripture was, God looked at everything and said, it is very good. It is very good. And I'll tell you this, we look around our world today, things are not very good. I have had all kinds of issues and problems in my office just this week that are not very good. And, and I say that just to say, we know we're not living in Genesis 1 of that very good earth and very good people. So there's a problem. So today, our message is on the fall of man. So go ahead and turn to Genesis 3. I want us to go ahead and read the entire chapter of Genesis 3 together. And then I want us to, to walk through it and understand what happened at the fall and why does that matter to us today. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate it, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the, his, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave to, to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the, and the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly will you go, and dust will you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head. And you shall bruise him on the hill. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree from which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat 
and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Father, thank you that this isn't the end of the story. That, Father, I pray as we open your word and talk about the fall and the reality of sin and the reality of what that does, that we will understand it. And I, I just pray that whatever we're struggling with this morning, that, that you would convict us like only you can. Because you're the one that can buy the plan, not us. In Jesus' name we pray. So as we go through, continue this series, I, you know, I, I don't want us to, to know why we believe something. I mean, that's important. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. But we also need to know, why does it matter to us today? Like, why is it important to know about the fall and what happened with the fall and what happened with sin? So this is more this morning about head knowledge. And that's truly what I pray every week as I prepare these sermons is I don't want to just teach you some sort of head knowledge. This is not seminary class. I want this to reach the heart and change us. So here's the thing. We can talk about the fall of man, but we will follow in Adam and Eve's footsteps and fall too if we don't understand what happened behind it. Now many of you, well, first off, let me be here. Last week, we talked about how we were created in the image of God, both man and woman. We are created in God's image. Understand, when Adam and Eve were created, they were not sin-scarred. And I know that's just, oh yeah, I know that. I know, but listen, they were in God's image with no sin. This is, this is how they were created. And there was one tree that God's like, don't eat from this tree. Don't eat from this tree. Now, this is an important detail. We'll come back to it in a minute. Who did he tell that to? He told that to Adam. Did you know that's before he created Eve? So the instruction of, here's a tree, don't eat from it, was given to Adam. And then God's like, oh man, it's not good for man to be alone. Uh, we need to create beasts of the field, and we need to create Eve, and all these things. So understand that, 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 so that'll come back in a minute. But Adam knew that he would die if he ate from that tree. He knew that. Okay, on your handout, very first uh, blank. There is a temptation to sin. Okay, so the first thing is we got to understand the temptation of sin. And we're going to do that by looking at the first six verses. Let's start with just verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, let's, let's picture the snake first off, before we get too far. Picture in your mind this serpent or this snake. Okay, first off, get him off the ground. He's not on the ground yet. Okay, so he's walking somehow. He's talking. He's reasoning. He, he had a relationship somehow with Adam and Eve. You know, this is one of only two animals in the Bible that talk. The other one is Balaam's donkey. Okay, so so picture this snake walking, talking, reasoning. Okay, and then I want you to think through what the temptation that the snake brought. Was. Now, many of you in this room have been through grasping God's word. Well, in that book, we talk about three things that I want to remind you of if you've been through it, and if not, this might be new to you, but based on this text, these are the things that God has brought me to over and over again. So there's three things that Satan likes to tempt us with based on how he tempted Adam and Eve. The first one is, is Satan or the enemy wants, question, wants us to question God's word, and that's exactly what happens in verse 1. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So the first thing a lot of times the enemy does is, does is very subtle. He comes, he comes and he says, oh, wait a minute. Did, did God really, did God really say that? Like, are, are you sure about that? Because I, I, I don't think that's right. Are you sure God said that? And so we begin to question, hmm, I don't 
No. Did, did, did God say that? Did, did he really say that? And so uh, that's why we spent an entire week here before now talking about the revelation of God. Like, we need to know that God is a God that reveals himself. God is a God that speaks, and he wants us listening to him. Because we have an enemy that the first thing he does is wants us to question, did God, did God really say that? And if you don't know it's God's voice, and you don't know it's him talking to you, you will miss it, and you will say, well, you're probably right. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I didn't understand him clearly. Maybe my ears were messed up that day. So God wants us to know his voice. But that's the first trap of sin. Is, is hmm, did God really say? Now, I want you to see something about how Eve responds. Keep reading. So the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, you may, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Is that what God said. She adds to what God said. God never said you can't touch it. God never said that. Now, I don't know because, again, I want you to think through this with me. God gave these instructions to Adam. I, I don't know. Maybe Adam was like, okay, um, I don't even want her getting near that tree. So here's what God said. You're not supposed to touch it or eat it. I, I don't know. But all I know is here we are at the point of Eve thinking she's not supposed to touch it. And that's not what God said. That's not what God said. So the first thing the enemy does is he wants us to question God's word. Number two, the enemy wants us to believe a lie. This is not in your handout, so it's not a blank. This, the first thing is he wants us to question God's word. The second thing is he'll start lying to us. Look at verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Satan absolutely lies to Eve. That's the second part. God wouldn't kill you. That's ridiculous. He created you. He couldn't get mad at what he created. We've got to be careful when we start thinking, oh, that can't be true. There's no way that would happen, right? That's exactly a lie from Satan. So we have to know God's word and know when the enemy is going against God's word because that's always a lie. That's always a lie. And remember what Jesus called Satan in John 8, the father of lies. I'll tell you this. We'll get into this in a few minutes, but just right now as I'm thinking through this, you, we need to know who we are in Christ. Like, we have father of lies that wants us to believe that we're not who Jesus says we are in him. And I'm telling you, it works. Many times, if you're listening to that voice and you're not listening to Jesus, I'm telling you, it'll get you off the path. Okay, so the first thing that the enemy does is he'll say, oh, did God really say? The second thing, he'll lie when we're tempted to do something. The third thing that happens with temptation is the enemy wants us to, this is big, to desire to be like God. You're like, I don't want to be God. Listen to verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And here's what happens. Satan wants us to say, you know what? You don't need to follow God's will. No, God's giving you a will. Follow what feels good. Follow what you want to do. Don't worry about God's will. What? No. And that's being like God. Where all of a sudden everything revolves around me and not around him. And all of a sudden everything's about my kingdom and not the kingdom of God. And everything's about my glory and not God's glory. And we're created to be in the kingdom of God living for his glory because he's king and we're not. But Satan wants us to think, oh, no, 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 it's about you. God created you, and we live in a culture that makes it about us. I think that's why Jesus in the garden prays, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Because even in his humanness, 
It was easy for him to want to follow in his own kingdom, even though it's God. And he says, not my will, but yours. That has to be our daily prayer. God, not about me today. Because temptation will drive us away and want us to go in our own way and not God's. Verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from the fruit and ate it and she gave it to her husband and he ate. So that's the first thing is she saw. This is what happens to sin. Like the first thing is it looks good. Like whatever it is that you struggle with, you know this. It looks good. And then, okay, well, I got to get in. And you, you, you take it. You do whatever it is that you're falling into. But the problem is then other people around you are affected by it. That's why we have to take sin seriously. It affects all of us. It affects your family. It affects your church. It affects your community. I saw a boy in the office this week. I'd never seen him before. He uh, he grew up in South Carolina. And uh, his mom and dad are both alcoholics and drug addicts. His grandmother got custody or took, got him last year of, in October. So he moved here in October. He's about 15. His sister is 10. She moved here around Christmas time. About a month later, I think she lived there, maybe, maybe a little bit before. So I was talking to the grandmother, and she said, I, I don't know what to do. She said, everything that he saw in his parents, he's going down the same path. Could you drug screen? I did. He was positive for drugs. Um, he goes, he, he drinks. He lies, he steals, and she's like, I don't know what to do. But here's, here's what's going on. This guy, he saw this in his parents, and all of a sudden, he's acting it out. And here's, here's the scary thing. You know what's happening with his 10-year-old sister? She says, he's going down, she's going down the exact same path. She is stealing like crazy. She's lying to my face, doesn't regret it one time. All these things that he, she sees in the older brother, she's doing. That's sin. Like, it's not just enough that we, we do it, but what happens is those around us are affected, which is why this is such a big deal. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I want to read you verses 13 through 15. Look what it says. Let no, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So from the, from the beginning, when Adam and Eve Satan loves to tempt. And to understand, our temptation never comes from God. It's not God saying, oh, I'm going to put that, that little parent in front of Mark again today. I'm just going to see how he reacts. That never happens. The Bible says he's not the one that tempts us. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, when you are tempted, God always gives you an escape route. So when you are being tempted by the enemy, and maybe that's where you are right now, Know that the Bible teaches God always, always gives you an escape route. Are you looking for that? When you're in that moment and you know the enemy's speaking to you and it's so easy to fall into that, God's like, I'm right here. I've got an escape route for you. Just come, come to me. So maybe right now you're in the middle of some temptation and the enemy is doing his best to deceive you and tell you things that aren't true. Are you looking for that escape route? Number two, second, second blank on your handout. There is a fear and an embarrassment of sin. There is a fear and an embarrassment of sin. Start in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves horn coverings. So all of a sudden, like their eyes were open, like, whoa, wait a minute, we're naked. Like they didn't even know before. And all of a sudden, they're like, wait, we're, we're, we're naked here. What's going on? So they try to fix it themselves by sewing fig leaves, right? 
So they try to say, okay, we'll make, our, make for ourselves some covering. And that's what happens when we sin. So often is we try to say, oh, well, I can fix this. And we try to fix it ourselves. It never works. It never works. Verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the tree of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? Where are you? There are two different main words for where in Hebrew. Okay? I need to teach you this little Hebrew lesson because it'll help make this make more sense for you. The first one that's the most common is IFO, E I F O. Okay? And what that, that's usually how we use it. Like, where did I put my keys? I can't, I can't find, help me find my keys. That is IFO. Like, wh where is this? That's not the word used here. That's not the word where used here. Because there's another Hebrew word that's more of an accusation. Like, I know I put you right here, and now you're not there. So where are you? Not that the person doesn't know where it is. It's more of an accusation of you're not where you're supposed to be. That's this word, A-Y-I. That's, that's the other word for where. So I may say, I may have my kids, like, I might say, where is my phone? Well, it might be like, kids, help me find it. I don't know where I put my phone, and that would be iPhone. Or if I'm like, Darby, I know you have my phone. Where is my phone? Like, I know where I put it. That's I, A-Y. Okay, so I want you to hear that because when God is speaking to Adam and Eve, it's not like he forgot where they were, or he's not omniscient, or he doesn't. It, no, that has nothing to do with it. It's, you're supposed to be right here. What do you do? Why are you hiding? What's going on? 10 and 11. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Who told you that you were naked? Listen, they were naked the whole time. They were naked the whole time. All of a sudden, it wasn't an issue. Look out at Genesis 2. Listen to the last verse of Genesis 2. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So Genesis 2 ends with, they're naked, but they're not ashamed, they're good with it. And all of a sudden, after this fall, this sin, they're like, oh my goodness. And so, so you see this going on, and all of a sudden they were, it's a bad thing for them all of a sudden. So why were they suddenly ashamed? And here's why. Sin leads to fear, and embarrassment. And that's what sin leads to. Sin leads to fear and embarrassment. If I went to work tomorrow and I just it, it asked one of my coworkers, or maybe just did a, a poll of the audience there, and I said, tell me the one time or the one thing that embarrasses you about your past more than anything else. And if, if it was truth serum, I guarantee you, almost every one of them, the embarrassment focused on some type of sin. That, that, if you think back on what is the one thing that you would hope nobody here ever knows about you? What is the one thing that you hope your closest friends, your family would never ever know about you? I bet it's because of their sin factor. Because sin leads to fear and embarrassment. So ultimately, Adam and Eve were absolutely afraid and embarrassed because of that sin. And they realized it. Here's what happened, though. Why did they sin in the first place? It's because they listened to another voice. That was God's question. Who told you? It wasn't me. God's like, I know you didn't hear from me that, because I told you the exact opposite. So who told you? So obviously you're listening to someone else. Who told you? What other voices have you been listening to? So many temptations. We fall to so many sins and we're so tempted because we're not listening to the right voices. Most of the sins that we commit is because we're not listening to God. We're listening to other voices and God's saying, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? 
I want you to think about something else with this. We live in a culture that absolutely glorifies perfection. And there's a tendency for us to think we just don't measure up. We're not good enough, right? That, that, that's kind of one of the things that can be within us. And when we have those thoughts, listen, we're listening to other voices. Like, so many times, I see this in my office. I, I had a girl not that long ago who's, who is absolutely anorexic. Um, I've had other ones that were bulimic, and, and the whole heart of what they dealt with, dealt with, they see things on TV, they see things in movies, and they're like, I'm not them, I'm not perfect like they are, and so they do everything they can to try to get perfect. And so what voice are they listening? It's not God, because God says, you're created in my image. If you're not satisfied with that, then you're not satisfied with me, because you're created in my image. So we can listen to those voices and think we don't measure up. Or in church, think about this. In church, you can, you can, God can save you and deliver you and say, I want to use you. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, 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 no. I, I can't, I can't teach, I can't, I can't invest in someone. No, I'm not perfect. I don't know enough Bible. And all of a sudden we think we don't measure up. Well, that's right. But Jesus put the Holy Spirit in you, and he wants to use broken people. He wants to use broken vessels. You have to be willing. But that's the lie of the enemy so many times. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not perfect enough. Whose voice are we listening to? Keep going, verse 12. Then the man said, the woman who you, who you gave me, gave to me, uh, she gave me this from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So let's talk about this whole deception thing. I can just picture Adam. Adam's like, oh, it's her. It's Eve. She did it. Oh, wait a minute. God, it's you, Ashley. You created her too. It's you. And you see Adam just absolutely trying to shift the blame. Listen, that's what sin does. Like you think, well, Adam, how could you possibly say that? Eve is God, God created Eve for you, and you're pointing the finger, and then he points the finger at him who created you? Are you serious? That's what sin does to us. We pass the blame. It's like, oh, no, 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 it's not me, it's them. But why did he do it? Get back to the heart of the, the story. Why did Adam do that? Oh, it's her fault, or it's your fault. It's because he's embarrassed, and he's afraid. That's what sin does. Don't miss that. And here's the question. I don't know, you may have never wrestled through this, or maybe you've had a whole sermons on this, I don't know. Was it Adam that sinned, or was it Eve? Like, who was the one that truly created the fall? 1 Timothy 2.14 says this. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was being deceived fell into transgression. Now here's what this text is saying. You can change this around to make it say something it's not saying. What this text is saying, Eve was deceived, meaning the serpent deceived her. Adam willingly chose to sin. He wasn't deceived. God told him specifically, you do not eat of this. He deliberately chose to go against God's word. That's, that's the text of 1 Timothy, is that Eve was deceived by the serpent. Adam knew that. He chose, he chose to sin. Yeah. A question to you before we move on to the next point is this. What are those things that would embarrass you if others in this room knew about it? What are those things that deep down you don't want anybody else to know? Because here's the thing. God already knows. You're not fooling God. He already knows. But here's the problem. Our tendency is to try to hide it from other people and then try to fix it ourselves. And that never works. That leads us to the next point. There are consequences of sin. Verses 14 to 20 is kind of the next part. There are consequences of sin. Let me just kind of go through what those consequences are. For the serpent, what did God do to the serpent? Number one, he's no longer walking. Right? 
So the snake, all of a sudden, goes down to the ground. And it's kind of, hey, you're going to be despised, right? I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, it says. So you see for the serpent, and here's the other thing you might not have ever noticed. God cursed the serpent. He never cursed Adam and Eve. He cursed the serpent. Now, what about the woman? What about Eve? Well, for Eve, I'm going to multiply your childbirth, the pain of your childbirth. And not only that, you're going to long for your husband and he's going to rule over you. So that was kind of what happened as a consequence of sin. Is Eve, you're going, to, you're going to first, man, you're going to have a lot of pain when you have babies. But number two, you're going to long for Adam, but he's going to actually rule over you. And then the third thing was Adam. What did he do for Adam? For Adam, he curses the ground. Adam, you're, it's going to be hard to work. Like it's going to be by the sweat of the brow. I mean, you're going to have all kinds of hard ground thistle and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Now, why is that important? You remember last week? Last week, we talked about the mission God gave us. And I said, God gave the mission to Adam. God gave the mission to Noah. God gave the mission to Abraham. God gave the mission to Mo all these people. He has the exact same mission. To what was the mission? Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Like rule over. That's the mission. Do you understand what happened with the fall? What did he do to being fruitful and multiplying? All of a sudden, the woman, it's going to be hard. That's the consequence. You chose it, not me, God says, right? You chose it. And all of a sudden, the mission of, of replicating became very difficult. And then, let's subdue the earth and rule over it. By the way, Adam, now there's going to be thistles and there's going to be thorns, the consequences of sin. So yeah, you still have the same mission, but it's not going to be as easy now that you've chosen your way and not mine. And we know that. We know that our fallen world is directly related to consequences of sin. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, into the world, and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sin. Make no mistake, our sin nature, how we are, and I know we, it's so hard having a sin nature being bent that way, is because of sin and the fall. It all goes back to one man, we all are sinners by nation. In our church reading plan for this week, we've been in Ephesians, and listen to how Ephesians 2 starts. And we're going to probably unpack some of this Later, but I want you to hear how Ephesians 2 starts. Listen to who you were before Jesus. This is because of sin. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly live in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And I think sometimes we just kind of gloss over the ugliness of our sin because we're in church, and we're supposed to have it all together. And it's all those people that deal with sin. No, we're the ones that got up this morning and put on some clothes, and we're here. And we gloss over this ugliness of what sin is. But by nature, it says, we are children of wrath. And before Christ, we were dead in our sins. And that's because there's always consequences of sin. And, and we'll come back to this in just a minute. But I want, to, I want you to see one other consequence found in Genesis 3 of sin that you may never have seen before. I had not seen this until about two weeks ago. Never notice this. Look at verse 20 with me. Genesis 3, 20. So that little passage of essentially 14 through 19 is just kind of what we talked about was the consequences to the serpent and the woman and the, and the, and the Adam. Now look at verse 20 with me. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Now, this is weird. Have you ever noticed this? God already named the woman in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, when God brings all these beasts and stuff to him, what do you want to name this one? What is, he names 
Here's why. Something different. It's not Eve. Have you ever seen that before? Look at look at look with me at Genesis 2.23. Genesis 2.23. The man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called not Eve. Woman. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, now let's 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 kind of understand. If you want to say man in Hebrew, if you want to say man, the, the term for a male is ish. Adam is mankind. Okay, so you may be thinking Adam, but that's mankind. Ish is male. Genesis 2, 23, when he names woman, when he names her woman, the Hebrew word is isha. Now, well, I want you to hear that because in the Hebrew, he's basically saying they go together. You see that? It's, it's basically the same word, and they go together like a hand in a glove. I'm ish. She's Isha. Like, we go together, like a hand in love. That, that was what he named her. That was before the fall. All of a sudden, the fall happens. I want you to see this. And he gives her a different name. He named her Eve. Eve. Eve is Chava. Chava. And it means literally like one that gives birth, like the living is what it means. It's like one who gives birth. And here's why that's important. Before the fall, she was defined by who she was. Her being. She came out of man. She was Isha. She's one of me. And all of a sudden, after the fall, she's defined by what she does. She produces life. That's sin. That's sin. And I say that because the first thing I thought about whenever I was, I was studying this was how often when I meet someone is my first question to them, hi, my name's Mark, what do you do for a living? And all of a sudden, our world is defined by what do you do? What service do you provide? That's not, that was, that's after the fall. All of a sudden, we're people that want to know what kind of service can I get from you? What do you do? Before the fall, it was all about who we are. I just want to suggest that maybe this mindset is a complete result from the embarrassment of sin. See, see, we don't, even us, like in our inner being, we don't really get who we are in Christ so often. That we are created, hand-created by God in his image, in our mother's womb. That he created us exactly how he wanted us. He didn't make a mistake. And that he he wants us to live for him and glorify him. And, and, and that is who we are. And all of a sudden, so often, we try to define ourselves to what we produce and what we bring to the table. It's never been about that. It's never been about that. And that Satan used that so often to bring us down. No, 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 you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And he brings us down instead of us resting in who we are in Jesus. And then what happens is we feel guilty because we're not, we don't feel like we're everything we're supposed to be, and we start making fig leaves ourselves to cover our nakedness. Now, our sin, understand, our sin is ugly. It is. It separates us from God. It always has done that. But we can't fix it ourselves. And that brings us to the last thing. The last point is there is a payment of sin. There is a payment of sin. Look at verse 21. The Lord God made garments of sin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So they already made garments, right? They already tried it. They somehow sewed fig leaves. I don't even know what that looked like. I kind of like to know what that looked like. So I don't even, do they have like string and stuff? I don't know how they do that, but they made garments out of fig leaves, and, and God said that that would work. And he said, I, I'm gonna give you garments that do work. So how does he do it? How does he do it? He makes garments out of garments of skin that cover them. What does that mean? If it's out of skin, I would think that means there's a dead animal sitting there somewhere. 
So even from Genesis 3, God is showing them, do you know what covers sin? It's not what you can do. Blood covers sin. Like there has to be a payment and an atonement for your sin, even in Genesis 3. So some animal had to pay the price for Adam and Eve's sin. You know, I mean, today we're talking about a lot of bad news, but thankfully, as we talk about doctrine, it doesn't stop with today's message. Because just like in Genesis 3, he provides an atonement, we're going to get to messages which are way better to talk about how Jesus becomes that skin cover, the Lamb of God. Romans 5 says, you know, that we're all sinners because of the sin of Adam. We read that a few minutes ago. Later in that same chapter, here's what the text says. It says, one act of righteousness leads to the justification for all men. So just like Adam messed it all up in Genesis 3, it says what Jesus did when he came on the cross absolutely made it right with him. Jesus came to be the last Adam, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15. And it says in that verse that we can have life through him. Meaning, what was the punishment again for sin? What was the punishment for eating from that tree of good and evil? Death. Well, through the last Adam, we can have life. And that's the gospel. That is the gospel. And it says in Ephesians 2, that we started reading a minute ago, that when we, while we were dead in our sin, like we said in Ephesians 2, it says this, God made us alive together with Christ. So that's where we're going. We're going, in the next several weeks, talking about how that looks for us to be alive in Christ. And I can't wait for us to kind of get to some of those messages. But today is the day that we need to wrestle with sin. We need to wrestle with and our sin really does separate. It didn't just separate Adam and Eve. Our sin separates us from the God that created us. So we're going to have a time of invitation. And, and I don't know what God's doing on your heart or if he's wrestling with you, but I want you to go ahead and, and bow your head and close your eyes. I've got two questions I, wanna, I want you to work with, or work through with me, okay? The first one is this. Guys, know this is a place that we can be real. We, we don't want to come here and play games. God, God's not, he's not glorified when we play games. Sin is ugly. Family, we need to heal. We need to heal. So first of all, my first question to you is this. Do you have a personal story that you realize the depth of your sin before Jesus came and washed you clean from it. See, you can try to be a good Christian and come to church, and guess what this can be? This can be our loin coverings. When we take fig leaves and we think we're, we're covering things, that's what church can be. But we need a skin cover. We need a lamp. We need Jesus. So my question for you is this. Have you ever truly had a time in your life where you understand the ugliness of your sin, how it completely separates you from the God that created you, and that you ask Jesus to come in and pay for your sin. Because he says, when you do that, you will be made as white as snow. All you have to do is ask and invite him in. So maybe today, that's what you need to do. If that's you, when we start singing in just a few minutes, I invite you to come up. We have leaders that will talk to you and show you what that looks like. The second one, temptation and sin will always be a problem until we are with Jesus in heaven. I mean, it's just something we'll struggle with. Maybe this morning, there is something that you're really struggling with. And maybe you're afraid to let others know about it. Because maybe you're embarrassed. Welcome to how Adam and Eve felt in the garden. Know that God is there, ready to forgive and help you through whatever you're dealing with. And you have a church family that wants to be in your life and help you too. Maybe you need to come and allow us to pray with you and pray through whatever it is that you're struggling with. At the end of the day, we want to be people that absolutely glorify Him in everything.
So if you need prayer, when we sing, this is your time. And I pray that you would do a work in hearts right now. If there's anybody that needs to come to know you as a Lord and Savior, that realize that they've just been going to church and they've never seen the ugliness of their sin that separates them from you, I pray that they would be the day of salvation. I pray that you would draw them so strongly that they just couldn't say no. That you would do a work in their heart like only you can. Father, I also pray in this moment for anyone struggling. God, we all have issues. But God, I pray that the embarrassment and the fear would just go away for just a moment, supernaturally, so that we can be real with you and turn those things over to you so that we can be fully yours. God, do a work.